I love you too, Mr. Binkles. Who's a good boy? Who's... I'm Michael Montero for Boxing Monthly. You're watching a Neutral Corner for the week of April 29th. I'm sorry, man. I just didn't know the camera was on. Just ignore that happened, okay? Let's get to some news and notes. Okay, so I know I've talked about this a couple times. Just wanted to get it straight one last time with the actual times of the broadcast. Joshua Klitschko. It's going to be on Showtime Live, 4.15 Eastern here in the United States. 4.15 Eastern, 1.15 Pacific Time, live on Showtime. The replay, HBO, 11 p.m. Eastern. So again, we'll talk more about that fight in a little bit. Uh, Buzzkill, fight being canceled, or actually not canceled all the way, but one of the fighters is off. Joseph Parker, Huey Fury. Fury suffers a back injury, he's out. Fight still on for May 6th, Replacement opponent is the Romanian fighter Razvan Kojunu, six foot seven Romanian. You probably know him best from when he got KO'd by Donovan Dennis in the Boxino Heavyweight Semifinal Tournament in 2015. I mentioned he's born in Romania, but he actually lives out here in the LA area in a suburb of Burbank. 16 to two, nine knockouts. I think he's rated in the top 15 by the WBO. So. This is within the WBO rules. All things considered, I get it. Don't love the opponent. This is a walk in the park for Parker. I think he should score a knockout here. The one thing that I think uh, is good about this matchup for him is it's a tall guy, six foot seven. So it's good practice for Huey Fury for uh, when that fight does happen later on down the line. For Fury, apparently there was a back injury in, in his lower back. They tried to do some treatment to deal with it, just couldn't. So they still are gonna have the fight. It's just pushed back till later this year, probably. And um, I still think it's an interesting fight. For Parker, he stays busy. You know, he had a really busy 2016, but hasn't fought yet this year. So it's important for a fighter like him, who's still a prospect, to stay busy. Didn't, ha <clears throat> didn't have a long, extensive, amateur career so I think that uh, it's a, you know important for him to stay busy it'll be interesting to see how he looks against uh, Kojunu he should score uh, I would say a mid-round stoppage here expect him to try to get some rounds in early but if he doesn't score a mid-round stoppage that's a that's a big big moral defeat for him May 26th at the UIC Pavilion in Chicago it is the return of Irish Michael Conlon He's gonna be taking over there in Chicago that day. Also, Mike Alvarado, remember him? He's on that card. He's lost four of his last seven. I'm not quite sure why he's continuing to fight. I don't see him working himself into a title fight anytime soon, but if he's trying to make some money, I get it. Uh, apparently, he's cleaned himself up. He was some substance abuse problems there for a while, particularly cocaine. Um, I, I was there in Denver for his rubber match against Brandon Rios and just talking with some of the people there around the camp and stuff wasn't good and you could see it and he looked like a skeleton in that fight so he's cleaned himself up since then good for him to stay busy I just don't know what much is going to come from this but also on that card Alex Saucedo is going to fight he's 24-0 with 15 knockouts Oklahoma City based Mexican born prospect 22 years old it'll be interesting to see him on that card and the mean machine the Lithuanian undefeated prospect, Igis Kavalishkis. Kava, I've heard that last name pronounced a few different ways. A few different ways I've heard it pronounced. Kavalishkis, Kavaliauskis. All I know is he's the mean machine. 16 and 0, 13 knockouts. Chicago has the second biggest Lithuanian population in the United States. So it makes a lot of sense 
for top rank to bring him out there. That should be a fun card, May 26th. And Chicago is another one of those markets where there's fans eager for boxing in that area. So I think that this card will do very, very well, uh, much like we saw in Washington, D.C. recently with the Ukrainian invasion. I think it's going to have a similar kind of feel to it. I expect that venue to sell out. July 8th, Billy Joe Saunders finally going to get in the ring against Adventil Kurtzaize. This fight will be in London. The venue hasn't been decided yet, but this will be for the WBO middleweight title. Kurtzaize just won the interim version of the title, which I'll talk about in a second. Billy Joe Saunders has pretty much done nothing since defeating Chris Eubank Jr. two, three years ago. So he's been kind of just hanging around. And he was in negotiations for Gennady Golovkin. Much has been talked about that. There was a June date, but apparently Billy Joe Saunders wanted to move that date up a week. I don't know why. I personally, the way these things work, I think it was a way for him to wiggle himself out of that fight. For Golovkin... And the date that they wanted during the big, big expo, the World Expo over in Kazakhstan, the HBO date, all that, there was a certain date they wanted to fight on. I want to say it was June 10th. I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it was June 10th. And for Saunders and those guys to want to push it up to June 3rd just made absolutely no sense. Here they are going to fight July 8th against Kurt Seize. All the momentum is with Kurt Seize. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Hopefully the judges won't be doing any home cooking. But that's it with the news and notes. Let's get to the review of last week's action. Lots of action last Saturday over in the UK and here in the United States. Let's start over in England. I just talked about Kurt Seize. So he scores a fifth round TKO over Tommy Langford. Uh, it was a great left hook counter. If you haven't seen the knockout, I tweeted it, but it, it's out there. there. There's a couple of YouTube clips I saw. Look for it. Uh, Langford just throws a 1-2 while backing straight up. Brings the right hand very, very low. Really threw the 1-2 pretty slow, honestly. And Kurtzaiza just timed it, came right over. It landed a beautiful left hook. And the fight was over at that point. Uh, Langford tried to get up, but he was done. So um, this was for the interim WBO middleweight title. Now, finally, Kurt Seize is going to get Billy Joe Saunders. I think that that's a fun fight. He's made Kurt Seize wait a long time for that one. So he's going to come in there mean, hungry. The guy's a little pit bull, man. He's five foot four. You just wonder if he could make welterweight, what he could do in the welterweight division. He's kind of a Sean Porter. Uh, kind of rude and crude and kind of bolt, you know, bulls his way in there and gets work done. Uh, you know, that would be an interesting kind of matchup to see those two. There'd be headbutts of plenty in that one. We'll talk more about that in a second. But as it stands, Kurt Seize and Billy Joe Saunders, July 8th in London. So in Liverpool this weekend, controversial fight. Martin Murray scores a majority decision over Gabriel Rosado. This was at 160 pounds. I didn't realize that. Uh, for some reason, I, I forgot about this, that he, Martin Murray's trying to move back down and get another title opportunity. I thought this was at 168 when I talked about it last week, but this was at 160. So Martin Murray wins. Two judges had it 119, 109. The other, or I'm sorry, one judge had it 119, 109. The other had it 116, 112. Two judges had it for Murray. And one judge had it 114, 114 even. And most people I've talked to, most unbiased observers feel that 114, 114 was the right score. A lot of people felt that this was a very close fight. I know a lot of people that I trust, whose opinion I trust, feel Rosado may have edged it. But I know a lot of people that feel Murray may have edged it by a point or two. But the 116-112 score is bad. The 119-109 score was absolutely atrocious. And that judge should be immediately suspended and should not be judging any high-profile fight within the next two years. That is a horrible, horrible score. Just based, I haven't seen the whole fight, but I've seen highlights of it. And just based off the highlights I saw, when I say highlights, I don't mean 30 seconds. I mean about 30 seconds of each round. I kind of saw a highlights package put together of all 12 rounds. And um, just based on what I saw, 
No way. That was a nine rounds to one fight. So after the scores were announced, Gabriel Rosado blew up in, in the ring after the fight. And he got up in Murray's face. He claimed a robbery. Has a legitimate case to be made there. And uh, Murray basically said, screw you. I won the fight. Get over it. Which, you know, I understand. That's his point of view. He feels he won the fight. And many people do. But uh, I, look, is, is there a rematch necessary? I don't think this fight was necessary to begin with. I don't think either guy looked that good from what I saw. Neither guy has looked good in recent fights. And who are they going to try to fight at 160 pounds? The only open title that Golovkin doesn't have is uh, the Kurt Saize Saunders winner, right? That's what you're thinking, right? But hold on a second. This is the WBA. Remember, I talked about this a while ago. I, this fight, Murray Rosado, was for the WBA Intercontinental Middleweight title, okay? But Hassam Nadam is fighting Ryota Murata May 20th in Tokyo for the vacant WBA regular middleweight title. Now remember, Nadam, the last time he fought a top-level opponent was David Lemieux back in 2015, and he was thoroughly defeated in that fight. He was dominated, dropped several times. Ryota Murata is a prospect who's 12-0 and hasn't fought anybody yet that warrants a shot at a title. This is more fuckery from the WBA, who I feel like I am constantly, every week on this show, bashing, and for good reason. So Martin Murray, you have to figure, is trying to wiggle himself into an eventual fight for the regular WBA title winner. And now him holding this intercontinental title, he's going to move up in the ratings and probably end up being at some point in line for the WBA interim world title, right? And the WBA talks about consolidating all their titles. They've been talking about it for a couple years. Here's another example, countless examples of them being completely full of shit. They are the laughing stock of boxing. And it's a real shame because, historically speaking, they're the oldest sanctioning body, going back to when they were the National Boxing Association here in the United States. So they've made a complete mockery of their history, and that's just further example of it. All right, let's co cross the pond and come here to the USA, where uh, we had a couple of, of fights. Let's go start on the East Coast, where at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, a reported crowd of 9,118 fans showed up to watch Showtime Sean Porter score a ninth round TKO over Andre Berto. There was a knockdown in the second and then a knockdown in the ninth uh, that was pretty much caused by a headbutt. A, a, a clean punch really didn't land that caused uh, Berto to get hurt. It was, it was a headbutt. Porter landed follow-up punches, but there were multiple headbutts in this fight. And a lot has been said uh, about whose fault it is. Is it Porter's fault? Is it Berto's fault? It's probably a little bit of both. Look, Porter does drop his head and bull, bull, you know, bum rush his opponent. He's been in a bunch of headbutt, foul-filled fights like this. But if you're fighting Sean Porter, you have to expect it. You have to game plan for it, and you have to be able to make adjustments. Keith Thurman was able to do that in their fight, right? Cal Brook was able to do that in their fight. And Andre Berto simply was not able to do it. So after a couple of those headbutts took place and there were cuts and everything else, and Porter got cut too, right? It was up to Andre Berto to, to realize that the ref wasn't going to do him no favors. And his corner had to realize that too. They needed to make adjustments and move laterally and pivot and time Porter on the way in. Uh, he kept trying to, he basically let Porter in and kept trying to counter him with these short, chopping little hooks that had absolutely no leverage on them. Porter just went right through them. And I thought Thurman did a much better job of catching Porter as he lunged in and nailing him a few times and getting Porter's attention, if not slightly buzzing him. I thought Brooke did a good job of smothering Porter on the inside and um, using Porter's aggression against him when they fought here at StubHub Center a couple years ago. So those guys showed the blueprint of how to beat Sean Porter. It's still a tough night in the office. You're going to work your ass off. But the formula is pretty simple. Andre Berto just couldn't get it done. And now look, for, for Berto, 
Uh, I believe now he's lost five of his last nine fights. I tweeted about this before the fight. He was getting $1.2 million, his purse for this fight. Sean Porter was getting $1 million. If you look at the trajectory of these two fighters, Porter's fought the much better opposition in recent years and, and won uh, as compared to Andre Berto. Again, lost five of his last nine, going back to like 2011 or something like that, going back several years. Porter, yeah, he lost the fight to Brook. He lost the fight to Thurman. Those are probably the number one and number two welterweights in the division right now. They're at least both in the top five, right? So there's no harm in that. And he was competitive in those fights and won rounds. How is Berto getting paid more money than Porter? Sometimes I wonder if Andre Berto has like Polaroids of Al Heyman in, in, a, in a gay bathhouse or something. I just, I don't know how he kept wiggling, wiggling his way into these paydays, but he has. At this point though, he's done. And I've been saying this for a while and I talked to... Uh, Andre Berto a couple years ago for UCN Live. We were wandering around the bowels of an arena. I can't remember which one it was, but we bumped into Keith Thurman, um, Virgil Hunter, Andre Berto, and I ended up interviewing all of them. And I saw right then and there that Andre Berto's tongue was heavy, slurring his words a little bit. When fighters start to get that heavy tongue, man, there, there, there's no damage yet. He's not in James Tony territory. But it's the, it's the signs that that stuff is starting to have an effect. It's time for him to retire. He's made millions of dollars. Why continue fighting at this point? If you're not beating Sean Porter, you're not an elite welterweight. And if you're losing five of your last nine going back six years, you're not an elite welterweight. So that's where Port or Berto's at. For Porter, this was a WBC eliminator. Keith Thurman got up in the ring after the fight. And they, Shaw, the, the, the Showtime commentator, was interviewing both of them. And um, I thought they handled the interview pretty well. I love the way Porter handled it because he was really calling out Keith Thurman right there. Keith Thurman was being a corporate man, though, and saying, yeah, yeah, we can do the rematch if that's what the fans want, if that's what my promoter does. But we could do that in November. He was talking about fighting again at the end of the year. And Sean Porter kind of egged him on a little bit like, hey, man, you didn't exactly say you were going to do it. The fans want to see this. I don't necessarily know if the fans do want to see it, but Porter did the right thing. I thought Porter handled the post-fight interview with a lot of class. I, I'm a huge fan of Sean Porter as a, as a, as a man, his father, Kenny. Uh, their father-son relationship is awesome, and they're truly the real good guys of the sport. Porter responded to the the headbutt situation very very well he said look i wasn't trying to do it it sucks that it happened he apologized to birdo right to his face and then the way he handled the interview with thurman i thought was great i wasn't happy with the way thurman handled it keith thurman just won you know the biggest fight of his career a while ago a couple months ago now and he probably won't fight again until november or december and it's either going to be against porter or lamont peterson so there you go. That's an issue with the WBC or with the PBC. Sorry. For the co-feature, Jermel Charlo scores a sixth round KO over Charles Hatley. There's a knockdown in the third and then in the sixth, he just blitzed him. Hatley was kind of lunging in. I think uh, Charlo had his back, back to the ropes and just countered with a nice right hand. Hatley comes straight in with his chin up. And it was uh, honestly a knockout of the year candidate for 2017. I think that'll finish in the top 10 of knockout of the year candidates. But it's not going to outdo Lemieux Stevens. The knockout of the year is set. No one's going to beat that. For Hatley, he hadn't fought since November of 2015. He was already KO'd once before in 2012. So is this really a big surprise? No, it was a showcase kind of fight for Charlo. But... Both Charlos have looked very strong and have sat down on their power and have looked very, very uh, entertaining, all of it, in recent fights. They don't fight often, but the last time they've been out, they've looked very, very well. For Jermel, this was the first defense of his WBC 154-pound title. All indications, it looks like he's going to stay at junior middleweight. His brother Jamal has moved up to middleweight. Jermel hanging out at junior middleweight. If they can keep it like that for a while, I'd like to see these guys go for titles. I'd like to see Jamel 
fight one of the other titleists that his advisor also advises there at junior middleweight. Easy fights to make. Why not do it? For Jamal, he's going to try, I imagine, to line himself with a fight down the line against maybe Triple G and try to do try to uh, pick up where Daniel Jacobs left off. One thing I forgot to mention, you know, just because this is a PBC fight, it just puts it in my mind, guys. I don't know if I mentioned last week, I talked about PBC on Spike being dead. But I don't know if I talked about the fact that PBC on NBC is pretty much dead now, too. Uh, NBC won't be doing any boxing programming with PBC post-2017. There's nothing scheduled right now. They might have one more card later this year. I don't even know if that's happening. I think it's just gone. The whole Spike thing I talked about, they were supposed to do 33 cards, Spike TV, with PBC through the, the end of this year. They only ended up doing 17 total. I don't know if I mentioned that last week. So they did about half of the cards that were originally part of that big press release they did going back to 2015. And Spike TV had an option for a third year and just didn't pick it up. So NBC, the same thing here. It's just interesting when NBC who is getting paid to put on these cards, all right? They're not paying for them. Spike TV, they were paying a small portion, like six figures, like 100, 200 grand. I think it was just 100 grand or so to put on the PBC cards. PBC was picking up the rest of the tab. They were paying the majority of it, but Spike was putting up a little bit. So you can understand why they'd walk away for that third year option, but for NBC, to kind of pull the plug. Man, they were getting paid for this stuff. So they're turning down money basically. Okay, so I don't know if somebody at PBC tried to restructure that deal or what, but that, that's very, very telling. So right now, PBC just exists on Fox Sports 1. I'll talk more about that in a second because in the, in the preview section because there's some cards coming up on Fox Sports 1. Everything on their schedule between now and June, and I tweeted this out today, is on Fox Sports 1, which is regular PBC programming in Showtime. And Showtime's not PBC. Showtime is a premium cable network that pays a rights fee for boxing. They don't work exclusively with PBC. They have a fight coming up this weekend, which I will also talk about later. Anthony Joshua, Vladimir Klitschko, that's not a PBC fight. Uh, Kelbrook, Errol Spence coming up, that's not a PBC fight. It features a PBC fighter, but it's no more a PBC fight than Gennady Golovkin, Daniel Jacobs was, right? So, uh, look, I know, beating a dead horse with this PBC stuff, but it, it just, you know, talking about a PBC fight here that was on Showtime again. Guys, the, the writing's on the wall with some of this stuff. I do think PBC, in some form or fashion, will continue, as I've said, but the writing's on the wall, man. And, and those of us who have been telling you guys that this was going to happen... Back in 2015, they were called haters and all kinds of other stuff. Well, where are you guys now criticizing us? Crickets. Okay, so here in LA at StubHub Center, in front of an announced crowd of 5,419, all of whom paid for their tickets, we had a pretty entertaining card. Uh, the undercard was underwhelming, but there were some entertaining moments. In the main event... Oscar Valdez scores a unanimous decision win over Miguel Mariaga in a, a very solid fight. Wasn't one of the great fights we've seen at StubHub in recent years, but it was a very, very solid, good scrap. And this was the type of fight that serves as a proving point for a young, young fighter on his way to being something special, I believe. Oscar Valdez is now 22-0, 19 knockouts. Miguel Mariaga isn't rated in the top 10, and I saw some of you guys tweeting about that. He's not a top 10 ranked guy, but he is a tough, battle-tested veteran that came to this fight in immaculate shape and came very motivated to win and gave a very stern challenge. It was the perfect matchup for Valdez at this time. The perfect test, perfect gut check. And Valdez passed it. This was the sec second defense of his WBO featherweight title. The scores. I talked about a bad score earlier. Well, 116-111 was a good score. That was one of the scores. But one of the judges had this 118-109. The other had it 119-108. Those two scores were atrocious. And both of those judges should be suspended immediately. 
and under review. And they shouldn't judge a title fight for a couple years. Those are horrible, horrible scores. This fight was no wider than eight rounds to four. I thought you could justify an eight rounds to four score, which is what 116, 111 does if you count the knockdown in the 10th round. I thought that was a good score. Some people thought it was a 7-5 kind of a fight. I could see that too. I think Valdez did a little bit more. Eight rounds to four is about what I scored it. Other two scores, way too wide. I want to talk about that 10th round. Miguel Mariaga was having a good round, working his way back into the fight. Close fight at that time. May have been even on the scorecards at that time, right? Right around even. And he was winning that round. And he was really putting pressure on Valdez and making him work. And this was the ultimate gut check. And this gut check didn't happen in the first or second round. It happened in the 10th. And for a young fighter, not used to going that many rounds, it says a lot that Valdez responded with a wicked body shot, some good combinations, dropped Mariaga. Mariaga came back strong. was trying to put it on Valdez for the remainder of that round. But that knockdown changed the fight and ultimately, I believe, set Oscar Valdez's career on a path that's going up. And I think he's going to be one of the guys at featherweight. That is a stacked division. And there are other guys coming up in that division right now, other prospects, other young titleists, that I think Valdez, down the line, is going to beat them. Uh, to drop him and close strong in that fight, I just think served as the type of gut check that he's not a pretender. He's a true contender, man. And um, he's someone you need to keep an eye on. And Boxing Monthly realizes this, and I don't want to spoil anything, but let's just say there might be a certain feature in a certain future issue penned by a certain writer coming up down the line. That's all I'm going to say on that. Also on this card, Jesse Magdaleno scores a second round knockout over the Brazilian fighter Adilson Dos Santos. There were uh, two knockdowns in that second round before it was waved off. Dos Santos complained, but the writing was on the wall. This was a mismatch type of fight. It was the first defense of his WBO junior featherweight title. Gilberto Ramirez scores a unanimous decision over Max Bursak to defend his WBO super middleweight title for the first time. This was a WBO card. Bursak was docked points in the 5th and the 11th for holding. All three judges had at 120, 106, which was the right score. Uh, Bursak didn't win a second in this fight. Ramirez won the whole fight, but not necessarily the most thrilling performance. The crowd was booing at times and doing the wave during the fight, okay? So for Ramirez, I'm just not sold on this guy. I've been saying it for a while. They've talked about Gennady Golovkin moving up in weight and fighting him. I have zero interest in seeing that fight. I want to see Ramirez in there against James DeGale and, and Smith and guys like that before I see anything else. Shakur Stevenson scores a technical decision in the sixth round. He uh, headbutts and cuts, stopped the fight in his pro debut. 60-54 three times by the three judges. Not a scintillating pro debut. Got a lot to work on, but he's only 19 years old. Let's see what happens with Stevenson. Um, not the greatest venue for him for his pro debut, but he did what he was supposed to do. All right, so last to talk about this week. Tonight, Tuesday, on Fox Sports 1 in Mississippi, it's another PBC card. Uh, Oscar Molina, 154-pound prospect fights. Mario Barrios, 140-pound prospect fights. And Charles Martin, American heavyweight Charles Martin, uh, originally from the St. Louis area, now living in the Los Angeles area, making his comeback since his defeat to Anthony Joshua last April. So he's been out of the ring for an entire year. That's going on right now as I'm filming this, so I don't have any other news. Friday the 28th, there is a card in Burbank, California, just uh, five, six miles up the road from here. It's going to be on Unimas. Casey Ramos versus Miguel Beltran in a lightweight matchup. That looks like it's probably going to be a pretty good scrap. And then Saturday, we have a few fights going on. So let's start over in the Philippines. Dani Nietes is going up against a Thai fighter, Comgrich Nantapak. Nantapak. 
for the vacant IBF flyweight title. For Nietes, this is his second flyweight belt, or I'm sorry, second flyweight bout. He uh, was at 108 pounds for a while, but with all the heat going on at flyweight and at 115, he wanted to start to kind of work his way up. And eventually he wanted to fight um, Estrada if he could, maybe even Chocolatito, but now all that's kind of up in the air. For Nietes, he's just going for another title here. He's been one of the better fighters in the lower, lower weight divisions in recent years. Now, in the United States, there's another PBC on Fox Sports 1 card on Saturday. Usually these Fox Sports 1 PBC cards are on Tuesdays. Sometimes they do them on Sundays. This one's on Saturday from the Palms Casino in Las Vegas. Undefeated Peruvian prospect, Carlos Zambran, taking on Claudio Barrero. This is for the interim WBA featherweight title. And this is actually his second defense of that title. Now, I've talked about the WBA before in this episode, I've talked about them just about every week. But here's another example in the featherweight division right now. Leo Santa Cruz is the WBA super featherweight champion. Abner Maris is the regular champion. And Carlos Zambran is the interim champion. Zambran's 26-0 with 11 KOs, like I said, out of Peru. So if he wins this fight, I don't know. Does he, does he get Abner Maris next? Abner Maris and Leo Santa Cruz are talking about doing a rematch next. Haven't really heard anything on that. Leo Santa Cruz has options with Carl Frampton, especially if he's willing to travel over to, to Europe. Is he going to do that? I don't know. There's some more problems with the PBC. Those are fights that people want to see. We're not hearing about it. But at some point, you have to think Zambran's going to be in line for either Maris or Santa Cruz. Probably Maris. We'll find out later. Now, of course, the big fight this weekend, Saturday over in Wembley. Um, Anthony Joshua, Vladimir Klitschko, the biggest heavyweight fight potentially you know, some people are saying it's, it's the biggest fight since Vitaly Klitschko fought Lennox Lewis. I think it's bigger than that. I think it's bigger than that. I think that this, it might be the biggest fight since Lennox Lewis and Evander Holyfield fought. I mean, I think it might go back that far. Because at the, at the time that Lennox fought Vitaly, Vitaly wasn't seen as the heir apparent. Vladimir was. Now, he, he was coming off, I think he had a loss recently before that fight and everything, but... Um, the Klitschko's, we got to remember, Vitaly lost to Chris Bird, and a lot of people basically said he quote unquote quit in that fight. So a lot of people had written Vitaly off. So even though Lewis wasn't in his best shape, a lot of people thought that he was going to just walk through Vitaly. That ended up being a great heavyweight fight, but it wasn't seen as this, this big mega thing, this big mega event, right? I really think you got to go back to like Holyfield Lewis. You got to go back to that kind of thing. Uh, I, I wouldn't include Lewis Tyson because that was a freak show. That fight didn't matter. Tyson was shot. This is the last great heavyweight, Vladimir Klitschko. Post Lennox Lewis, and I get in arguments with people about this. People talk about the Klitschko brothers, Vitaly and Vladimir, owning the division. I'm sorry, but that's just not true. Vladimir owned that division. Vitaly briefly was the number one guy right after he fought Lennox and Lennox retired. And Vladimir had lost to Corey Sanders. Vitaly beat Corey Sanders. So for a year or so right around there, he was the top guy. But you got to remember, he retired in 2004 because of injuries. It didn't come back till 2008. From 2004 to 2008, Vladimir Klitschko cleaned out the division. And when Vitaly came back in 2008, he had a couple of fights against poor opposition, didn't really fight one of the top contenders at that time, Vladimir did. From 2004 till 2015, Vladimir Klitschko cleaned out the heavyweight division. Boring or not, whatever. He owned the division and had a historic reign that is right up there with Larry Holmes and Joe Lewis. And now you've got Anthony Joshua. Gold medal in the Olympics. 18-0 with 18 knockouts, looks the part, looks like a young Vladimir Klitschko, the way he's built, and he's going up against the last great heavyweight. Yes, Vladimir lost his last fight against Tyson Fury, but there's an asterisk next to that fight because of everything we've learned about Fury since and things that 
happened with Fury before that weren't reported at the time. So I think this is a huge, huge matchup. I did a 20 plus minute preview and prediction video on it. Find it, check it out. I think this is going to be a better fight than expected. I do think it's going to start technical and slow, but I think that in the middle rounds, here's where it's going to get interesting. I'm not expecting Foreman Lyle, okay? I'm not expecting Ali Frazier here. But I do think at some point, Vladimir's chin is going to get checked, and we're going to find out just what kind of shape he's in. Is, did he get old overnight? Is he rusty? Or is he sharper than ever, right? And at some point, AJ is going to get tested. And this might serve kind of like, you know, I talked about Valdez Mariaga earlier in this episode. And that was to a smaller degree, not just weight wise, but in terms of the, the scope of the fight. But it was kind of that gut check, right? We haven't seen that with Joshua. And I think that's what people really, really want to see. And Klitschko, even if he is shot, even if he's nowhere near his best, and I don't think he is. I think he's nowhere near the guy he was five years ago. That was evident in 2015 when we saw his fights against Jennings and Fury. But if he has anything left, anything, he will check Joshua's chin at some point. And he'll check his heart at some point. And that's why this fight will be interesting. It'll be nerve-wracking and exciting. Maybe not the action, but it could all change with one punch with these two guys. These are two hard-hitting heavyweights. So... That in and of itself is going to create tension. And that's why I think this should be a very thrilling, interesting fight. Also on the undercard of this uh, fight, Scott Quigg, he fights. He's been training with Freddie Roach. And all indications say that he looks really, really good training with Roach. It's a good match. Luke Campbell's fighting. Katie Taylor is fighting. Talked about it before. She is the one right now. Clarissa Shields gets a little more PR love here in the United States for obvious reasons. No need to go into all of it. But Katie Taylor is staying busy. And she looks like if someone's going to push female boxing a little forward in the Western world, I think it's going to be her. Clarissa might be able to get herself a big, high-profile fight at some point that the mainstream media here pays attention to very briefly but I think it could be a shot in the pan kind of a thing. Katie Taylor is getting in the ring and fighting. This is her third fight in, I think, less than six months. That's what a prospect is supposed to be doing, male or female. Speaking of female, I, you know, I didn't talk about this when I, I was reviewing last week's fights. Amanda Serrano, she won the WBO 118-pound title, the vacant bantamweight title on that Porter Berto undercard. She's someone who's been really building a brand, you know, a female boxing brand out there on the East Coast. She's won multiple titles now. She's doing it the right way. Amanda Serrano, Katie Taylor, these girls are setting an example. If you want to really build something with female boxing and promote that, those, those women are showing how it should be done. So that's it for this week, guys. Comment, like, share, subscribe. I'll see you at the fights. Oh, and for any of you who are going to Las Vegas next week for Canelo Chavez, I'll see you there live.